அனைவருக்கும் இனிய காலை வணக்கம் ஃபார்ம் கிராஜுவேட்ஸ் ஃபோரம் சார்பில் தொடர்ந்து நடத்தப்படும் இன்று ஒரு தொழில்நுட்பம் நிகழ்ச்சிக்கு உங்கள் அனைவரையும் வருக வருக என வரவேற்கிறேன் இன்று நாம் காண உள்ள தலைப்பு எக்கோ சிஸ்டம் இன்ஜினியரிங் ஃபார் சஸ்டைனபிள் அக்ரிகல்ச்சர் அதாவது நிலையான வேளாண்மைக்கு சுற்றுச்சூழலை வடிவமைத்தல் இந்த தொடர்பான தகவல்களை நம்மிடையே வழங்கிட வருகை புரிந்துள்ளார்கள் டாக்டர் கே சத்யகோபால் ஐஏஎஸ் ரிட்டையர்ட் அவர்கள் டாக்டர் சத்யகோபால் அவர்கள் தற்போது எக்ஸ்பர்ட் மெம்பர் நேஷனல் கிரீன் ட்ரிபியூனல் சவுத் சோன் பெஞ்ச் சென்னை ஆக இருக்கிறாங்க அவங்க மேலும் இவர் முன்னாள் அடிஷனல் சீஃப் செக்ரட்டரியாகவும் கமிஷனர் ஆஃப் ரெவன்யூ அட்மினிஸ்ட்ரேஷன் ஆகவும் ஸ்டேட் ரிலீஃப் கமிஷனர் கவர்மெண்ட் ஆஃப் தமிழ்நாடு ஆகவும் சேர்மன் ஆஃப் சேர்மன் அண்ட் மேனேஜிங் டைரக்டர் ஆஃப் வாட்டர் ரிசோர்சஸ் கன்சர்வேஷன் அண்ட் ரிவர்ஸ் ரெஸ்டரேஷன் கார்பரேஷன் எந்த நிறுவனத்திலும் பணிபுரிந்தார்கள் மேலும் ஹைதராபாத்தில் அமைந்துள்ள நேஷனல் இன்ஸ்டிடியூட் ஆஃப் பிளான் ஹெல்த் மேனேஜ்மெண்ட் என்ற நிறுவனத்திலும் தலைமை இயக்குநராக பணிபுரிந்து அனுபவம் பெற்றவர்கள் ஆவார்கள் இன்றைய நிகழ்ச்சி நமது குழுவின் மூலம் நடத்தப்படும் முன்னூற்றி நாற்பத்தி எட்டாவது நிகழ்ச்சியாகும் இன்றைய நிகழ்ச்சிக்கு உங்கள் அனைவரை வரவே வருக வருக என வரவேற்பதுடன் டாக்டர் கே சத்யகோபால் அவர்களை நிகழ்ச்சியை தோக்குமாறு அன்போடு கேட்டுக்கொள்கிறேன் ஒன்னும் Uh, today uh, the topic is ecosystem engineering for sustainable agriculture mm-hmm. all of us are aware that there is a need for sustainable agriculture in view of the uh, problems fa- faced due to climate uh, change and as part of that strategy i felt that we should also address certain common concerns so during the course of the lecture though i'll be focusing on ecosystem engineering for sustainable agriculture this will also explain how we can reduce the cost of production for the farmer how to increase climate resilience how to promote judicious use of pesti- chemical pesticides and chemical fertilizers how to promote soil fertility and how to promote water conservation and how to protect the integrity of ecosystems and how to prevent health hazards to farmers farm laborers next Joe, next. Next, please. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Ah. So, I think since most of you are uh, graduates in agriculture, all of you are aware that integrated pest management has been introduced in the year uh, 1967 by um, Smith and Vandenborn. And after that, they started adopting this IPM as their uh, stated agriculture management. and in india in 1985 uh, government has declared that ipm is the official agriculture ministerial policy by 1970s two schools have emerged one school is called as a school of tactical ipm for them economic threshold level based strategies and pesticide centric uh, strategies are very very essential and they have treated farmers as passive recipients of Uh, the advisory is being given by the uh, agricultural officers the second school of uh, strategic ipm is the second school this school believe that the approach should be ecosystem centric and one should treat the farmers as partners next however by the late 1970s so the ecological foundation of ipm was overshadowed and the tactical school was ascendant so etl based ipm is being uh, adopted worldwide for a long time and even today in india etl based ipm is uh, being adopted 
in fact uh, during the course of my interaction with several uh, scientists of icr uh, professors from uh, state agriculture universities and extension functionaries most of them still have a belief that etl based ipm is a, a wonderful strategy and it is an essential strategy to be followed by everyone so during the course of the lecture i will explain how there are several limitations to this etl based ipm and what we should try to do next <clears throat> what is the need for ecosystem uh, centric sustainable agriculture so all of you are aware whatever agrochemical that we are using whether it is a fertilizer or the pesticide they have a potential to cause um, pollution to the air to the water to the soil and including the ground water it will be having an impact on the uh, ecosystem next the consequences of the uh, these strategies where uh, etl based ipm was uh, focused one could see biological magnifications of the non biodegradable uh, chemical pesticides and one also has con was confronted with the problem of pest replacement the classic cases in cotton when bt cotton was used helicoverpa was controlled but in the absence of uh, helicoverpa secondary pests like white flies they have started becoming dominant and today farmers are facing this as a major problem next now what should we do if we are not adopting the um, uh, etl based ipm what should we try to do so it is being suggested that we should adopt sustainable climate resilient agriculture strategies how do we do that for that we need to have and can you just go back an ecosystem based pest management strategies why should it be an ecosystem based strategy because we are dealing with agro ecosystems and before we move forward we should understand what an ecosystem is so an ecosystem is defined as it is a functional unit i will repeat it's a functional unit in which there is a intricate interdependent relationship among the various constituents so that the unit is always functional so an ecosystem is a functionally independent unit unless we realize this fact whatever strategies we adopt may end up in disrupting the ecological balance and the ecosystems in which we are working they are likely to be damaged this is what is happening when we try to put excessive chemical fertilizers where in several areas it led to eutrophication or there is excessive reliance on chemical pesticides which has also decides uh, pest replacement pest uh, resurgence and um, various other crop related problems it has also re uh, resulted in uh, health problems to the human beings so this is the reason why for us we should uh, there is a strong need for understanding the ecosystem in which we are operating next so when you look at these strategies broadly we need to classify these strategies as below ground and above ground next so next below ground let us discuss about below ground management see for below ground management we should understand soil the importance of soil organic matter i don't need to emphasize that because all of you are graduates in uh, agriculture and horticulture its significance is both uh, biological physical and chemical so unless the soil organic matter is uh, ensured the crop the soil fertility will not be there and the uh, the, the crop uh, growth and yield levels will be very low next so today uh, one should be happy that instead of uh, the earlier strategies many pesticide chemical pesticide companies are suggesting chemical treatment of the seeds which to a great extent will reduce the need for chemical pesticides subsequently however we are having a better strategy and that is called biopriming so biopriming basically it refers to combination of seed hydration which is a physiological aspect of disease control and inoculation biological aspect of disease control of uh, how do you do that you inoculate the seed with some beneficial organism to protect the seed so this is an alternative to the chemical control 
and i presented a picture here this has been uh, downloaded from the website of uh, international rice research institute and on the a side you can see the seeds which have been treated with uh, trichoderma harzianum and on the right side the b side you have seeds which have not been treated with trichoderma and when you look at the nursery you find the growth difference which clearly shows that the biological organisms which we are relying upon they not only control seed borne seedling borne and soil borne pathogens they also trigger growth promoting hormones so that the growth of the uh, seedlings will be very very uh, healthy and the plant health also will be good next uh, in when i was there in uh, nipham as director general uh, one of my colleague from tamil nadu dr gopal he became uh, chairman of tobacco board so i interacted with him and then we tried to educate the farmers of uh, tobacco in andhra and uh, karnataka so if you look at the pictures down below let you let us have a look at the uh, nursery bed treated is treated with trichoderma and pseudomonas flourescens and on the right side you have untreated they might have used even chemical pesticides for treating the uh, seeds you can see the difference in the growth and even at the individual uh, plant level if you look at the picture above you can see the uh, sapling treated with trichoderma and pseudomonas is taller and the leaves are much bigger next today i think uh, more or less i think most of the farmers are aware about trichoderma and when you they will say t viridi so they may not know what t stands for but they are using uh, trichoderma uh, to a great extent which is a very welcome sign but this another uh, fungal organism which is much more important than trichoderma i would put it that way and that is nothing but vam vam is being produced in a big way in uh, our country but it is used very uh, less to a very small extent only it is being used this mycorrhiza in fact some scientists they have called it as an internet below the soil because the hyphae the extra radical hyphae of the mycorrhiza it will connect the roots of different plants and form a network and there is a specific purpose for this formation of the network they have communicate uh, uh, through chemical uh, substances between uh, different plants whenever a particular plant is attacked by a disease immediately certain chemicals are released and these chemicals are transported to the neighboring plants to activate their own immunity so a chemical communication goes on between uh, plant to plant underneath this many of us may not be aware for a moment we will forget about the uh, importance of chemical communication with among the plants what are the other importance of mycorrhiza it enhances the absorption capacity of the plant to as much as 700% than in the case of a normal non mycorrhizal root it also helps in absorption of nutrients particularly phosphorus in uh, when there is an association with mycorrhiza i don't need to tell the importance of mycorrhiza to all of you unless the uh, adequate quantity of phosphorus is there neither the uh, inflorescence nor the yield level will be adequate next let us just have a look at this picture on one side you are having a, a network of uh, hyphae which you can uh, which has been mentioned as mycorrhizosphere and on the other side you are having a non mycorrhizal rhizosphere where you find only the uh, lateral uh, roots so from this we can clearly understand the absorption of water nutrients will be much more and from a much wider area than from by a root where there is no mycorrhizal association so much so that some scientists they call the real root of a plant is not its root but its mycorrhizal association so for them unless there is a mycorrhizal association the root functions are not adequately performed next how do we promote this uh, mycorrhiza in fact these 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 pictures 
are based on the research I have undertaken when I was Director General of uh, NIPHM. And from this, you can see whenever we have treated with mycorrhiza, we have isolated a species of uh, uh, Blomus interradices. And then uh, we have treated on different crops. Whenever the treatment is given, both the root length and the shoot length was much more than uh, in the untreated uh, seedlings. And if a farmer has to use his mycorrhiza, the department's recommendation is approximately a three, three kgs per acre. And even if we are talking about a small and marginal farmer, he will be having about three to five acres. So the cost of per kg formulation in the market ranges between 60 to 150 to 200 rupees per kg. If it is three kgs per acre and if he is cultivating in three to five acres, imagine the cost how much it will go up to the farmer. For that, there is a very simple solution. What the farmer should be trained is, he should be asked to purchase one kg of formulation because the smallest size could be one kg. Then he should be asked to purchase about 10 pots of a medium size height, keep seven pots separately and three pots in another corner. After filling up the pots with the soil, the three pots, normal plantation of whatever seedling they want, whether it is sorghum, maize, paddy or whatever, uh, or even, uh, what is that? Uh, uh, any species of their choice, they can try to plant. Now, in the remaining seven pots, what they should try to do is, before putting the seed in the small depression, which they'll be make, making to put the seeds, to dibble the seeds, they should apply one or two spoons of the formulation which they have purchased from the market. Then put the seeds, close it with the soil and water it normally. Both the seven group of uh, one group of uh, pots, which are seven in number and another group where three pots are kept separately. So uh, after watering for about 21 days, in case in the seven pots, the growth of the seedling is not taller and the leaves bigger than in the control plot. That means the formulation which you have purchased is of poor quality. Suppose if these are bigger, taller and the leaves are wider, straight away you can satisfy yourself whatever formulation you have purchased is one of qualitative product. Then what you have to do, you should continue to water it for another 10 days and after about 30 to 40 days, one should stop watering the all the pots and within a week or so the plant will die. Now the plant can be removed and the roots can be cut into small pieces, mix it either ideally with vermicompost or with any organic manure and it can be applied in the field or in the nursery, wherever they want. In these roots, the intraradical spores of the mycorrhiza will be there. Now, coming back to the soil in the seven pots, the soil in the seven pots will be having extra radical spores and the hyphae of the extra radical hyphae of the uh, uh, mycorrhiza. So that means the entire soil in each and every that seven pots is again a, a formulation, a, a, a very rich uh, soil with mycorrhiza. So this also can be used in the field. By doing this, whatever is the requirement of the farmer, whether it is three acres or five acres, he can produce it within his farm and also test the quality of the formulation which is purchasing from the market. Once he does this, the cost of mycorrhiza will come down to the farmer drastically. Next. Joe, next slide, please. And we should also understand that mycorrhiza actually produces a glycoprotein called glomalin which contains 30 to 40% carbon. And this uh, mycorrhiza, especially glomalin, will help in, form, in forming soil aggregates, which adds a structure to the soil. And also it keeps other stored soil carbon from escaping. And studies have shown that glomalin accounts for 27% of, of the carbon in the soil and is a major component of soil organic matter. Humic acid, which all of us consider to be very, very, very important, it contributes only about 8% of the carbon, whereas glomalin contributes 
So that is the significance of uh, glomalin, and it helps in carbon sequestration also. This humble fungal organism can make significant contributions in reducing the cost of production for the farmer as well as make him climate resilient and also contribute to the society by enhancing the carbon sequestration. And in all the plots where I conducted research myself along with my colleagues in uh, NIPHM, we found that the yield is much higher than in the normal untreated plots. In fact, the yield formation also takes place about 10 to 15 days early. So the, the harvest, you can complete it within uh, 10 to 15 days than the uh, before than the normal period. So there are multiple advantages with this mycorrhiza. Unfortunately, in our country, the farmers are not exposed to the advantages of mycorrhiza. I think these are all the things which we are learning only in the last few decades. For example, even Trikodarma, when I was there in the field, I don't think the generation of uh, agriculture officers, some of whom are participating in this lecture, uh, importance was not given to that trichoderma those days. But today, we have come to a stage where most of the farmers are using trichoderma viridi or trichoderma harzianum or whatever. So we should again now focus uh, on this aspect of popularizing BAM so that all the farmers, except those who are cultivating cabbage and cauliflower, they can easily adopt mycorrhiza because studies have shown that 90% of the plants in the world they have mycorrhizal association. So this fact should not be um, missed. Next. The other thing is, all of us, we are aware about the importance of nitrogen fixing bacteria. So usually we associate it only with uh, legumes. Of course, the graduates um, uh, in agriculture and horticulture, they know the importance of azospirilla, uh, which can fix uh, nitrogen even in non-leguminous plants such as cereals, millets, oil seeds, and cotton. And studies have shown that 25 to 30 percent of chemical nitrogen fertilizer can be saved by appropriate use of azospirillum inoculants. Uh, to that, we can also add a couple of other um, uh, cyanobacteria, which can also in enhance the nitrogen fixing ability uh, uh, in that particular field. Next, Azola, for example. The next thing is, Vermiculture stroke vermicompost. This is what I captioned it. All of us are now very confident and that vermicompost is widely used. Again, when I was there in the field, a few farmers were vermicomposting and they were, they were considered those days as progressive farmers. Today, every farmer is using vermicompost. Then why did I use the word vermiculture? See, we have to move to a new phase where vermiculture is done by all the farmers. What is the need for it? I will just explain. Because of the burrowing and soil feeding habits of earthworms, the soil becomes porous, which permits adequate aeration and quick absorption of water. It also permits easy and deep penetration of plant roots. They also bring the fresh subsoil to the surface, which is still finer and rich in organic matters. And we should, it, it was a bit surprising for me. When I came to know that a fertile acre will have about 25 lakh earthworms. Why it is important? Let us have a look at the next slide. From this picture, you can make out that there are three types of earthworms. One is epigeic on the surface, endogeic just among the litter, and then anisic, which will go up to two to three meters. And also they form these tunnels. From the pictures you can make out. Now let us try to close your eyes and then visualize. In an acre, about 25 lakh earthworms when they are forming this kind of a, a network of a channels, what will happen if there is a rain? Automatically, the water will go down up to 2 meters or 2 feet or uh, 3 meters as much as the channel formation takes place. And what is this? This is what is ideal drip irrigation is. Today we are all fascinated by uh, surface drip irrigation systems which are being pushed left, right, center with heavy subsidy from the common. Where is nature without a single pie being charged? If we allow the earthworms to grow on their own, they will create a healthy 
system where the entire rhizosphere will be having adequate quantity of water that to at levels where the roots need it not on the surface if it is uh, surface drip irrigation it is only there on the surface not below half a foot uh, water will go only when you use subsurface drip irrigation systems the water may go down further but if you are ensuring that your earthworm population is adequate in your fields you are indirectly creating your own natural drip irrigation system therefore there is a need today for every farmer to culture the worms and apply them in the field but today what is happening they just apply sieved vermicompost during the process of sieving all the clitellum and other eggs and their uh, small worms they are all removed and it is used by that particular progressive farmer to compost more um, manure it's good but if every farmer is doing this vermiculture and then if he is trying to uh, compost whatever organic uh, manure that is there in the field imagine to what extent the fertility of the soil can be enhanced no wonder our forefathers have called at firm as farmer's friend that is the first sentence we read in a zoology textbook and even today the same sentence will be there and many of you may not be aware that charles darwin who is known for uh, theory of evolution he has worked for 30 years studying on the dynamics of earthworms in his backyard garden and for him earthworms they play a very important role and he considers them as ecosystem engineers next again a lesson one fact for many people is entomopathogenic nematodes see whenever there is a root grub problem whether it is for sugarcane or for groundnut or the rhinoceros beetle problem we struggle and notice that whatever chemical pesticides are applied you will not be able to control but nature has provided a simple solution all of you are aware about nematodes many of you might have studied the parasitic nematodes plant parasitic nematodes nematodes animal parasitic nematodes or even human and nematodes which are parasitic on human beings similarly there are some nematodes which are entomopathogenic they will just only attack insects that is the reason why they are called as entomopathogenic and the beauty of these entomopathogenic nematodes is once they are in the soil they will go in search of the host with a little moisture in the soil being there they will be able to go in search of the uh, grubs attack them and multiply and kill them in fact uh, with the help of one of my colleagues uh, from nipc by name dr sunanda in maharashtra we have helped large number of sugarcane farmers and we train them also how to produce these uh, nematodes it is very simple uh, science it is not at all a complicated thing and i think even tamil nadu agriculture university there are some uh, scientists who are uh, helping in preparation of nematodes uh, it just can easily be done it is not a very expensive uh, uh, activity wherever this uh, grub problem is there it can be done and in coconut fields if rhinoceros beetle is a problem if you want to control the grub uh, uh, you can make use of this entomopathogenic nematode and interestingly the diamond back uh, moth in cabbage which is a massive and major pesticide major pest in uh, cabbage can also be controlled through a uh, foliar application of um, entomopathogenic nematode so these are some of the strategies which i think the uh, most of the scientists themselves most of the extension officers also Uh, they, even if they have studied earlier they might have uh, forgotten uh, because of the emphasis that is there on uh, etl based ipm which is chemical pesticides in fact and not to speak about lack of awareness among the farmers next so now i have given some strategies uh, by which how we can enhance the um, reliance on non agro uh, uh, non chemical pesticides and control the pests we will also look at how to enhance the soil fertility with simple um, uh, strategies today uh, the it is an all india average which i got it uh, from uh, our um, research data from our uh, agriculture scientists 150 kg of nitrogen per hectare is used this is not required and all of you are aware the moment you are applying excessive urea the plant grows beautifully only to attract succulent pests that is not a healthy growth 
and once the succulent uh, pest population is there immediately there is a tendency to apply chemical pesticide and then get into a vicious cycle of being forced to use more and more uh, chemical pesticides to the extent that one uh, spray before a spray and one spray after the spray so therefore first of all we should try to reduce the reliance on chemical fertilizers which will also protect the soil fertility natural soil fertility for that what we have to do all of you must be wondering soil test prior to application of fertilizer sir i think is uh, uh, is not aware that all the farmers uh, in our uh, state they have all done the soil testing repeatedly this must be all of you must be laughing in your heart but uh, invariably in all my lectures i used to ask the agriculture officers a simple question okay 100% we appreciate you how many of the farmers are using the soil test report for application of fertilizers invariably there will be a pin drop silence in the lecture then after some uh, uncomfortable movement here and there they will say sir about 30 to 35% of the farmers are using the soil test report for application of fertilizers to that extent i am very happy but we are still having about 65% to 70% of farmers who are not looking at the soil test report they are just keeping it in their cupboard and we all know that the soil test report will be valid at least for 3 to 4 years and even after 3 to 4 years there will not be drastic reduction so or they can go for a fresh test so if and invariably why this uh, test report is going into the cupboard when he does the soil test report that by the time he gets his uh, soil test report the first crop is almost over but the extension officer and the farmer they are forgetting that this test report can be used for another 3 years and if he is doing two crops for six seasons six crop seasons he can use it by using it what is the benefit for him he will apply appropriate fertilizers of appropriate dosages otherwise he is blindly applying fertilizers at a very high cost and attracting unnecessary guests that is the succulent pests so this is one aspect which our extension functionaries and farmers they should try to understand now as i said after applying the um, fertilizers based on soil test report we should also consider one more thing this was actually a traditional practice where most of the farmers uh, during kudimarama days they used to remove the tangsel and apply in their fields today we want everything to be done by the government but who is the um, loser the farmer also should think okay government sometimes they have uh, initiated kudimarama scheme revived that and then we have given the tank silt free of cost about 3 years back but again this silt will be washed away over a period of time so once in a while this tank silt as and when the tank silt is accumulated in the uh, mineral irrigation tank that can be uh, removed with the appropriate permissions and then applied in the farmer field and we have noticed that whenever tank silt is applied two major things will happen for the farmer what are they one the water absorption and retention capacity in the field goes up and because this tank silt is having lot of um, um, fertile organic uh, materials the need for application of chemical fertilizers has come down and uh, we have also noticed that the farmers have got a bumper uh, crop also so this is something which i think farmers will have to rely upon this is again a very simple affair it is not a very expensive affair also but unfortunately today uh, farmers are trapped into purchasing very expensive chemical fertilizers and chemical pesticides rather than looking at the uh, lesser uh, low cost options which are available right before their eyes and as i mentioned we should try to use bio fertilizers particularly mycorrhiza trichoderma and mycorrhiza pseudomonium uh, pseudomonas florescens and if there is any other uh, bacillus beneficial if you are using these soil microbes in a consortium it they not only control the uh, uh, pests particularly the fungal and bacterial uh, pests they also enhance the soil fertility soil health and then also promote the plant health once the plant is healthy its probability to get infested with diseases will come down the next step is use of organic manure today fortunately most of the 
farmers are using organic manure and also vermicompost but that slight change is required here instead of using seeded vermicompost i would actually it's my dream we should come to a stage where all the farmers are applying unseeded vermicompost in their field once you are applying unseeded vermicompost the earthworm population in the uh, in the field will increase substantially and if you are not applying uh, chemicals then the earthworm population will be able to uh, survive and they will create a natural drip irrigation system in addition to our water absorption i forgot to mention earlier what the earthworms do during the course of their um, survival and then the burrowing um, activities they remove lot of pathogenic organisms and the excreta is full of nutrients all of you know uh, the importance of uh, vermicompost so this in combination with the moisture at a lower level that is the best combination which you can provide to the uh, plant any amount of your surface drip irrigation no doubt surface drip irrigation is very very important it has reduced the uh, water requirement uh, to a great extent we are not denying it if you are having vermicompost and vermiculture un uh, unseeded vermicompost applied and build up the earthworm population on top of it you can still use drip irrigation system so that you can have the better of both the worlds then we need to use plant growth promoting rhizopia as i mentioned earlier once we do this we can reduce the requirement of nitrogen to about 60 kg per hectare so that means in one stroke you are improving the soil health soil fertility reducing the uh, pest attacks pest load promoting plant health and also uh, reducing the cost of production for the farmer next water conservation again there are some simple techniques which everyone again this is another uh, interesting question whenever i used to uh, pose this i used to get very interesting responses system of rice intensification i think most of the uh, officers in this gathering they will say sir we are adopting sr but unfortunately when i talk to the farmers who are there in the high cut areas of most of the mine irrigation tanks they are not resorting to the alternate dry and wet spells paachalam kaachalam adu illa they are not adopting the sri in its entirety at the best they are only going for spacing and studies have shown i i have lot of pictures also whenever you are adopting rice intensification strategy in its entirety the root growth will be very 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 heavy and you will be shocked to see some of the pictures uh, where non sri field uh, root paddy roots will be very sparse <clears throat> similarly sustainable sugarcane initiative is another strategy which farmers can adopt which will reduce the requirement of water incidentally mr rathu and uh, mr jo uh, very soon i think i will introduce one of my colleagues who works with me with nfhm uh, by name uh, shrikant he is an expert in the system of rice intensification as well as rice based ipm uh, only thing is he may be uh, giving lectures only in english or telugu i will introduce uh, him to uh, your group so that your his services can be made use of uh, sorry for the digression yes. the another strategy is region farrow method ikset has developed this region farrow method uh, especially for pulses and uh, dry land cultivation this again we are not popularizing that much in fact we were surprised the entire uh, uh, delegation led uh, by then finance secretary uh, mr shanmugam myself um gagandeep singh bedi then principal secretary, uh, secretary agriculture etc we all went there we found that the clay soil in fields where region parameter was not adopted it was like a rock we went in the summer whereas the next field where region parameter was adopted we could press the clay with our hands with our fingers to that extent the advantage is there soil and water retention of course i have already spoken about um, the technique developed by me i leave it to uh, those people who are interested i am very happy that one mr jabraj 
from Tinnel Valley, he showed interest. We are trying to work out with him. Uh, let us see how the results will come. And the importance of drip irrigation and sprinklers, I don't need to mention. Definitely, whatever we are doing, if you want to conserve water further, you will be able to, you can take advantage with drip irrigation and sprinklers. Next. So I talked about below grounds, including water conservation. Unfortunately, most of the extension officers, they go to the farmers only when the plant comes above ground. So there is a strong need for the extension functionaries to talk to the farmers about below ground management before they start uh, seed treatment. In, with, instead of with chemicals, they should do it with by pesticides and so on and so forth. Let us now look to above ground management. Next. <clears throat> Anyway, I will not uh, bore with you people with the statistics. The statistics here shows that huge amounts are being spent on chemical pesticides, of which 45% is herbicides, 28% is insecticides, 22% is fungicides. Unfortunately, only 5% is having biopesticides. And today, 9.1 billion US dollars are being spent globally on insecticides. In spite of it, 40% of the crop, both pre-harvest and post-harvest, is being lost before it is reaching the, the table for either the human being or for the livestock. Next. It is shocking to know that insects each eat crops which can feed 1 billion people every year. So every year we are losing crop which can feed about 1 billion people due to the damage that is being caused by the insect pests. That is the reason why we have been using a lot of uh, insecticides. But unfortunately, the tragedy is more than 600 insect pest species, they have developed resistance. So let's move forward. Next. So this is again a standard question which I used to ask in all my lectures. Uh, all of you can read that question. Though I used to ask them to just list pesticides, 95% of them, they used to write chemical pesticides. Hardly 5% people used to think about biopesticides, though pesticides include both chemical as well as biopesticides. That shows to what extent our mind has been washed away by the lobby, which talks only about chemical pesticides. It's a hard fact. Uh, it is very difficult to accept also. We simply blame the farmers saying that, sir, it is very difficult to convince the farmer to uh, not to use chemical pesticides. Forgetting the simple fact that no farmer was aware about a chemical pesticide and they became aware of it only because of our common tool system. And for that, the agriculture department, horticulture department, the administration, the collector, the agriculture secretary, everyone has to take blame. Today, I am not saying introducing it in the 1960s, it was bad. At that time, there was a dire necessity to increase the production. And at that time, we were not aware about the evil consequences and long-term consequences of uh, long, uh, the chemical pesticides. Unfortunately, the uh, ecosystem-centric approaches have not picked up. But today, we are aware about all these things. In spite of it, we consider chemical pesticide as the panacea for all the problems. So let us see how whether it is really uh, helping us or not. Next. Ah, again, a silly question. This is what uh, most of my participants used to uh, uh, think when I asked this question. And I used to ask them. Obviously, the, re the results will be, uh, the, the replies will be quick uh, re response. Quick re results are there. Why? Why do you want a quick response? So that you want to kill all the pests. Why do you want to kill all the pests? To reduce the yield loss. Why do you want to uh, reduce the yield loss? We want to reduce the yield loss. What a silly question, sir. Only to increase the farmer's income. So, in nutshell, everyone used to say we are using chemical pesticides so that we have a quick result, kill all the pests, reduce the yield loss, and income, increase the income level of the farmer. I hope all of you also will agree with that. It's a good uh, objective. So, let us see whether it is happening or not. Next. The paradox of using chemical pesticide based on EPL. See, all of you are aware that it is in California for the first time chemical pesticides have been introduced. So in 1970s, 
some of the farmers have been asked to use chemical pesticides on ligus bugs in cotton fields and after some time people said okay chemical pesticides are being used let us study what is happening so they studied fields which are using chemical pesticides and those fields which have not used chemical pesticides to their utter shock they found that the yield levels were not different what is the reason in fields where chemical pesticides are used they found that there is a pest replacement with secondary pests which could be cabbage looper beet armyworm or bollworm or whatever which caused serious damage and in some cases they found that ligus bug itself has become resurgent why it is because of pesticide resistance so from the standard economic point of view it doesn't make any sense to use chemical pesticides because these are all very expensive and whereas a farmer who is not using chemical pesticide he was getting an x amount of yield and uh, the yield level in the farmers field where chemical pesticide were used that was also very close to x either marginally lower or sometimes marginally higher so therefore they found the study found that it cost farmers money to lose money why they are spending money on chemical pesticides and what is the end result whatever money they have spent on chemical pesticides it is not realized therefore we should all understand by recommending exclusively chemical pesticides we will be advising farmers to spend money only to lose money okay now some of you may be thinking sir why are you giving an example of uh, uh, california don't we have some other country which is closer to us let us see next jo indonesia so let us come to southeast asia here just like us they have introduced this um, hybrid variety that set right in 67 and once this um, uh, system was introduced bph problem started emerging and in uh, 85 86 severe outbreak, uh, outbreak uh, happened there and the surprisingly the indonesian government has banned 57 organophosphate pesticides and removed the pesticide subsidies that drastically reduce insecticide use i don't think it is possible for us to ban uh, chemical pesticides overnight in our country it happened there and what did they do they adopted ffs and isa isa stands for agro ecosystem analysis based ipn and once they did this the bph problem has subsided i am sure in this gathering some of you may be thinking sir right, you are just generalizing it um, maybe the results are uh, a fluke you have to use chemical pesticides next there were a group of scientists in indonesia the moment the then president mr suharto has laid down his office they said no 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 unless we use chemical pesticides we cannot control our uh, pest problem and uh, yield levels will go down so they started reusing chemical pesticides in 2002 and the moment they started using chemical pesticides the bph has started returning with a great vengeance and in uh, which started as a small populations in 2009 by 2011 in java alone 1.96 million tons of rice was damaged so okay now i will give a classic example of uh, papaya mealybug which all of you are aware in tamil nadu andhra karnataka and uh, neighborhood what happened when papaya mealybug accidentally came along with the papaya <coughs> fruit imported from southeast asia Uh, without following the uh, regimens of uh, biosecurity the papaya fields in coimbatore they got affected and all of you know at that point of time uh, coimbatore was one of the biggest uh, producers of papaya so the government the universities the uh, icr institutions everyone they tried to control this papaya mealybug with uh, chemical pesticides but they did not have any result then they studied where did this papaya mealybug come from they found that papaya mealybug is native to mexico and in mexico this is not a major problem when they studied why it is not a major problem they found that there are four parasitoids which are controlling this uh, papaya mealybug so then government of india with the help of usda us department of agriculture it has imported the four parasitoids and uh, the institute in bangalore icr institute in bangalore in uh, they they imported it they multiplied it and then uh, tamil nadu agriculture university and other universities and other extension functionaries of other states 
they were all trained to multiply this parasitoid after identifying that among the four esophagus papillae was found to be very host specific and uh, very effective so they spent totally about 3 crores to import these parasitoids and mass multiply them and release in the agriculture fields within 6 months the papaya mealybug population was controlled by esophagus papillae and what are the uh, uh, savings to the uh, government nearly 1600 crores of rupees uh, income was saved because papaya was, uh, was having multiple benefits besides the fruit uh, the latex etc and the dependent industries all of them they have uh, benefited so that is the story of um, uh, so i have an example of california the lion's den where chemical pesticides have been introduced then in southeast asia where uh, ffs and asa have been introduced in in view of chemical pesticides and I gave our own classical example of uh, papaya millibug in Tamil Nadu to show that there are strategies which can control the pest population without relying on chemical pesticides. And relying on chemical pesticides at the end of the day may not give you the economic return for which you are applying these chemical pesticides. Next. Many of you think that ETL based IPM is the best strategy. But what are the limitations? Just let us have a look at it quickly. First of all, in ETL-based IPM, they do not look at the plant health, nor, they, nor do they look at the plant compensation ability. And many scientists, I was surprised to know, many of the participants in my lectures, I won't say scientists, many participants, they were not aware about the plant compensation ability of rice. They were not aware that during the first 40 days after transplantation, during the vegetative phase, even if there is a damage to the extent of 30 to 40 percent, the damage to the leaves, the, the tillers, the, the paddy plant can compensate by side tillering without impacting its yield level. Not knowing this fact, looking at the pest population and the number and the threshold level it has come, people were advised to apply chemical pesticide. So unnecessarily the farmer is spending money, not knowing the, uh, the plant compensation ability that paddy will side tiller. Then they also, not, they have not realized that whenever chemical pesticides are used, whether the pest is dying or not, almost all the natural enemies will die. So you are creating a conducive environment for more pests to come by applying chemical pesticides in the first 30 to 40 days in a paddy field. The ETL based strategies, they also, they did not take into account the natural enemies, which play a very important role in maintaining the equilibrium in an ecosystem. Whenever there is a pest problem, by now I think all of you may be aware, when the herbivores they feed on the leaves, the plant emits certain volatile chemicals, which will go as a signal to the natural enemies, either a predator or a parasitoid asking them to come and protect it and they will come to that particular plant and control the pest and always there is a balance if the population of the um, uh, parasitoids and predators goes beyond a level the pest population will come down that is what we want and after some time again the uh, the predator and prey due to lack of host their population may come down then pest population may go up this is a cycle which is maintained beautifully in an ecosystem without ca causing damage to the plant and the yield levels which the farmer wants. So next, in ETL based strategies, they also don't take weather factors into account and it is very difficult for a farmer or for that matter for any scientist to understand what will be the market price of a particular um, uh, crop, uh, say let us take onion. Today, the price of onion may be about 30 rupees. So when the farmer is going, uh, is planting onion, his ETL will be calculated taking 30 rupees as a return. Now, by the time the crop comes to harvesting, the 30 rupees may come down to 10 rupees or it may go to 100 rupees. In either scenario, the threshold levels will change. So no one can pinpointedly fix the threshold level and the number that has been fixed was found to be very arbitrary 
and for the same pest in different uh, countries different numbers have been put. and the last uh, negative consequence of this etl based iqm is they have relied exclusively on chemical pesticide it was primarily chemical pesticide driven next insecticide resistance many people uh, uh, during the lecture they used to reply that why insects are getting resistant most of them they think that the excessive application of pesticides will be the cause of resistance resistance does not come physiological resistance plays a very uh, insignificant uh, role the real cause for the resistance is in any given population some insects they have genes which are resistant to resistant to the chemicals now whenever we are applying the chemical pesticides if for example 100 pairs are there 95 pairs will die the farmer is happy the extension officer is happy the chemical pesticide industry is happy and scientist is happy but what we are not realizing is along with the 95 percent pest population pairs all natural enemies are killed now five pairs are there and these five pairs they will start multiplying so in one or two three seasons the entire population will be having genes for resistance uh, to the specified chemicals that is the reason why more and more insects are developing re uh, in, uh, resistance and once they become resistant any amount of your chemical pesticide will be of no use so this is a fact which we should try to understand what is the point we have to understand presence of natural enemies in an ecosystem is very very vital to remove your pest population okay next what are the other consequences of etl based uh, strategies today internationally maximum residue levels have been prescribed uh, uh, by the uh, western countries they were all well prepared when this uh, regulation was uh, part of the wto negotiations what? we were not prepared for it and as a result many farmers who thought that they can export their agriculture produce in a big way post um, entering into the wto regime they were shocked their produce was returned saying that the maximum uh, residue uh, limits prescribed for the pesticide has been exceeded many consignments of grapes have been returned so subsequently government of india with multiple agencies they trained the farmers how to produce uh, these um, uh, agriculture products with uh, less reliance on chemical pesticides and today we are back in a position where we are comfortably exporting some of the agriculture products um, by adopting special strategies where is the same in the mrl standard the entire production will be unfit for human consumption so very recently we had the case of uh, noodles which have been banned because of certain residues being higher than what has been prescribed so this also we should try to understand the other point we should also understand is pesticides they can cause health effects right from top to bottom from external surface to all internal organs so this also we need to understand where any strategy which is relying ex ex very heavily on chemical pesticides the consequences will be very very serious next next please jo next yes sir yes sir ah yes, uh, so as i was mentioning earlier in 1990 indonesian government promoted this farmer based uh, ipm education program which is called as aisa and today in 2002 fao has given up etl based ipm and switched over to agro ecosystem analysis based ipm in um, NIPHM, we have introduced another small uh, improvement to that. We said ISA based IPM in conjunction with ecological engineering for pest management. What it is, I will explain in the coming slides. Next. See, ISA is an approach which can be employed gainfully by extension functionaries and farmers to analyze the feed situations with regards to pest, defenders, soil conditions, plant health, the influence of climatic factors. and the relationship of growing healthy crop next so this is the first step is they in the prescribed uh, 
unit in a particular acre they will study they will observe and then step 2 they are asked to draw diagrams individually and then in step 3 they discuss in uh, smaller groups and make an analysis and in step 4 the larger group they will sit and they will make a diagram let us just go and see how, how the diagram looks like in the next slide uh, sorry i'll show the slide uh, picture later so when, what are the observations they are making they are looking at the plant health at different stages they are looking whether there is any built in compensation ability for the particular crop which they are dealing with they will arrive at the plant the pest and defender ratio so the pd ratio is a ratio the thumb rule is if for every two pests in that given area there is one defender no management decision is required so the defender will be able to control the pest this is the thumb rule 2 is to 1 then they will also look at the soil conditions they also look at the climatic factors whether there is any favorable climate um, for a pest attack to happen which farmers based on their experience they will be much more aware than any scientists in this country or for that matter anywhere in the world the farmers past experience also is given due uh, credence while decisions are being taken next so this is the diagram which they prepare on one side they draw the pest on the other side they will be drawing the defenders and uh, through insect zoo the farmers will be made to understand that not all insects are pests they will be surprised to know that there are several insects which are beneficial which are expected to control the pest population next next slide please yes. so now like i was mentioning that all of you are aware about the isa based ipm which all of you are supposed to adopt it because this is the policy of government of india as well as the state governments uh, and through farmer field schools we were been adopting this isa based ipm now i said we have attached ecological engineering concept which has been introduced by a scientist by name jeff gar and his uh, team jeff gar is a australian scientist so he says ecological engineering relies on the philosophy of using cultural techniques for what purpose to effect habitat manipulation why should you have manipulate the habitat to enhance biological control so ecological engineering is nothing but a strategy that relies on the philosophy of using cultural techniques to effect habitat manipulation and enhance biological control next slide please what do natural enemies require natural enemies require food like any other uh, organism and their food is pollen and nectar if it is a parasitoid and if it is a predator in the absence of a prey they survive on pollen uh, especially on nectar then they need shelter which should be different from the shelter provided by the main crop and there should be host or prey if it is a parasitoid it should have a host if it is a predator it should be a prey and there should be both the primary host or primary prey and also an alternate host or an alternate prey depending upon the situation for their survival next what did uh, jab garan team they suggest let us take a paddy field this was adopted in uh, southeast asian countries and i am giving an example of uh, vietnam all around the paddy field they grew flowering plants so some of you may be thinking sir our uh, forefathers also they were planting castor uh, on the field buns see castor is a trap crop basically to trap spodoptera and helicoverpa whereas the flowering plants the focus is on attracting all parasitoids and incidentally predators because once the flowers are there along with the parasitoids some small population of pests will come and immediately predators will come and what do these parasitoids do they have their food take shelter and after some time as thanks giving to the farmers or to the field they just go in search of the uh, pest in the field and lay their eggs either in the egg or uh, uh, caterpillar stage or pupal stage and then kill the control the pest population so you are having a different types of flowers which are grown for different type of a crop in niphm we have uh, brought about uh, uh, isa based ipm in conjunction with ecological engineering for a large number of crops where what are the flowering plants for different crops have been indicated can we go back to can we go to the next slide please this is a close up next 
so on uh, on the field channel where water is flowing on either side also they have kept the flowering plants next whenever they have planted uh, sesame gingerly it attracted the egg parasitoid anagris nilaparvate and which is helpful in controlling the bph problem so different flowers they attract different parasitoids and they control different pest populations so wherever you are having bph as a major problem immediately we should try to put sesame as a uh, bun plantation all along the field or in between the buns also and now i showed you some ecological engineering pictures uh, imagine for a moment in kambam valley that was the district where i was the first collector or our delta area if all along the green paddy paddy fields if you put the flowering plants imagine how we will change the landscape and what are the so many spin off benefits also that are there and how much does it cost the farmer per acre it costs approximately 500 rupees and once you do this after some time you can uh, make use of the flowers and sell them and you recover your cost it is only an investment on which you will be able to get back not only the uh, uh, money spent plus there are so many benefits like reduction in chemical pesticide application and increase in yield levels Let, uh, can we go to the next slide please Mr. Joe, how much more time I have? Joe, sir, okay. you can you can you can uh, uh, take your own time. Uh, no problem, na. Okay. Yes, sir, no problem. Now, yes, sir. In Africa, I have introduced another strategy called push pull. Push pull strategy, technically, it is called a stimulo deterrent diversion, and this was first documented as a potential pest control uh, strategy in uh, 1987 in Cotton, Australia. And in 1990s, the U.S. it was used uh, for controlling uh, the onion fly uh, in onion crop. And in Africa, this push pull strategy was uh, used to control stem borer Chylopatilus and the parasitic weed Striga hermonica. What has happened? Let us see. Next slide, please. African farmers they had a massive problem with these uh, two pests. and they were struggling they applied large uh, number of uh, chemical pesticide different combination they tried they failed then suddenly it struck them why can't we use this push pull strategy for that what they have done is all along the field boundary they have planted napier grass and in between the maize they planted desmodium now what has happened the desmodium leaves they were emitting volatile chemicals which was pushing the uh, stem borer away from the maize plant and napier grass was emitting certain volatile chemicals which is attracting the um, stem borer towards it uh, can you just give me one minute huh? just yes, a minute sir. yes sir hello hello yes sir please so this uh, napier grass is attracting the stem borer towards it and the surprising thing is once the stem borer lays its eggs on the uh, napier grass leaves it produces a viscous substance and control and uh, circle and circles the eggs thereby it kills the stem borer now the advantage of uh, desmodium which they have not initially found out was the roots were emitting certain chemicals which was uh, inhibiting the um, uh, striga weed from attaching to the uh, roots of maize so there was a suicidal germination and striga weed also was controlled next slide please next next oh, uh, one, one second sir there is some issue i'll just uh, take it back Uh, yes, sir. Uh, the farmers they have got multiple benefits by adopting this push pull strategy. So, in addition to the maize, they got napier grass, which is a fodder, desmodium again, which is a fodder crop. They the livestock farmers were happy, and farmers having livestock also they were very happy. 
In addition, the desmodium crop is a legume. In addition to its uh, inhibition of the parasitic weed, they were fixing nitrogen and enhancing the soil fertility. Therefore, it was very beneficial and it was also acting as a cover crop to retain soil moisture in those fields. So the farmers in Africa are very, very happy. Next. This is a ready-made bug, which is also called as an assassin bug, which is very powerful predator in controlling a host of um, uh, pests, including the, um, uh, on, uh, what is that? This, um, Mama. Uh, Brinzel, in Brinzel, you're having a particular pest which looks like a ladybird beetle with a hard carapace, which is very difficult to control. But we found that, uh, that this assassin bug, what it does is, it just gives a prick on the uh, ventral side of the uh, pest and immediately it becomes a par uh, paralyzed and then the assassin bug comes back and sucks the body fluids. And it does the same thing with all caterpillars also. And this assassin bug can be multiplied by the farmers within their farm fields, which is if there's a small hut. Spiders and assassin bugs, they can multiply. For which training is being given in uh, NIPHM. In Gamana Tamil Nadu also we adopted that scheme. I think some of the districts, they are doing it also. Next slide, please. Spiders, again, they play a very, very, very important role in controlling the pest population. They are diverse in um, numbers and uh, they, they, they occupy different niches of an ecosystem. Some of the spiders, they occupy top of a crop, some in the middle, some at the bottom and some on the soil. All these spiders are different and they attack a host of uh, pest species. And it has been found that every year, 400 to 800 million tons of insects are being eaten by spiders internationally, globally. And this is a study carried out by Science of Nature Journal in 2017. To that extent, spiders are important. Next, next slide, please. In uh, NIPHM in the field, which is having a very poor uh, soil uh, quality, we adopted this ecological engineering. And on, uh, in January 2014, in one field, we found so many different spiders. All the pictures that are here, they are all spiders, different spiders. Next. And we also found that whenever ecological engineering for pest management is adopted, a host of beneficial insects are coming to the field, whether it is in the form of um, uh, adult or even as a grub, they control, they, they are uh, predatory in nature. And we also identified certain parasitoids which are visible to the naked eye. By and large, the parasitoids are not visit, uh, visible to the naked eye. See, the larval stage of syrphid fly also is a predator. So we found all these things in the field by which they will, you will be able to control the pest. Next. In Malaysia, where they have adopted uh, this uh, ecological engineering for pest management, they found that the entire field is covered with uh, spider web. So to that extent, the spider population has gone up and which invariably will control the pests. Next. The next strategy is usage of lures, pheromones and light traps. As far as light traps are concerned, you see, when we were there in the field, those days, solar uh, lamps were not there. Power itself was not there in all the villages. And even the light traps, they, if you switch on in the evening, it has to be switched off the next day morning. But fortunately, today you are having solar-based light traps or even uh, electricity-based uh, traps, which can be timed. After four hours, it can be switched off automatically. What is the need for switching off after four hours? Studies have shown that from 6.30 in the evening to 10.30 in the night, the fields will be invaded by the pest population. And after 10.30, all insects which come, they are all beneficial insects from 11 p.m. to morning. So if you are putting the light trap, all insects are attracted to uh, light trap, whether they are beneficial or pest population. If you are having a timer-based light trap from 6.30 to 10.30, you can operate it, trap all the pest population 
and then switch off the uh, light uh, the light trap automatically so that the natural enemy population is not impacted next so the studies have shown that whenever ecological engineering for pest management is adopted the pest population in the given field was 16.6% parasitoids was 24.4% predators were 40% detritivores right are another uh, 19% so the parasitoid and predator population is 64%. That means in the PD ratio, the defender population is much, much higher than even the pest number. So therefore, the farmers, there was no need for them to use chemical pesticides. And they could get their yield to their satisfaction. Next. So what are the advantages if you are uh, adopting ISA-based IPM and ecological engineering? It reduces the production costs. It increases the health and safety of farmers and consumers. It protects the environment and ensures ecological stability and sustainability. Okay, next. In NIPHM Hyderabad, we experimented this on cabbage and cauliflower, but primarily cabbage. For the next slide. Initially, we grew uh, mustard. Then subsequently, we put uh, in the same crop, uh, the sunflower, onion, and a whole lot of other things, marigold, by which, from a distance, many of the students, they used to think that it is a sunflower field. Only when they used to come very close to the field, they realized that cabbage is the main crop. Similarly, the pest also will get confused for two reasons. One is the visible confusion. The second thing is, when cabbage is there, it emits certain chemicals. But other crops like onion and others, when they have been also raised, they emit a different set of chemicals and they mix up. And a confusing signal is sent to the pest, which will not be attracted towards the cabbage. Next. Next, please. So we have uh, for three consecutive years, without a drop of chemical pesticides, we grew cabbage. We used only neem oil and four-year spray of entomopathogenic nematode. Uh, we can adopt similar strategies for um, uh, cauliflower, but whenever there is heavy rain, cauliflower will have a whole lot of pest problems. So one needs to be very, very cautious while uh, uh, doing these strategies. Next. So how do we reduce chemical pesticides? First of all, we have to decrease usage of nitrogenous fertilizers, as I've already mentioned. Then adopt ISA-based IPM. Use lures, pheromones, and light traps. Adopt ecological engineering for pest management to enhance natural enemies. Tap the plant compensation ability of paddy. Uh, and then avoid chemical pesticide sprays to control leaf feeders up to 40 days. That is the vegetative phase. And recently I came across that one Mr. Sushinder from Mirza Chalam, he has invented a very slow cost paddy weeder which our uh, agriculture uh, department people have gone and studied and found it to be very useful. And uh, that is uh, a simple way of uh, removing the uh, weeds rather than going for herbicides. Next. So based on these uh, strategies, uh, Government of Tamil Nadu in collaboration with uh, NIPHM, they introduced the eco-friendly IPM villages. I think even today, some of the districts, it is there where farmers were trained to produce uh, trichoderma, then uh, VAM, then also spiders, uh, also um, uh, vermicomposting, and also the assassin bug, redwood bugs also multiplication. So these are some of the strategies. I think I've already taken almost one and a half hours. Uh, with this, I think I'll stop here. Uh, if there's any question, I will try to take it. Thank you, Dr. K. Sadhu Gopal IAS for your excellent presentation on the topic today, the ecosystem engineering for sustainable agriculture. Nilayana, Velonmi, Sutu Chulale, Vadivamitar Todarbana, Tahavalkan, Armeahe, Walanga Patulane, Farm graduates, Kulumatin Sarbil, Yanadin Nanjar, the Nandine, Terivitu Bolgare, Artha Nikhilchi, Bravil Arma Mahrade, Anivaru, Kathir Kumara, and Bodukate Bolgare, Nandi.